we're going to save questions for the end, just so we can get to uh, Claudia and Evelyn. I forgot to mention, there is a QR code on your table. We had just a quick questionnaire. Uh, we want to hear from you all as far as who you are, what training needs you're interested in, um, what you do in the community, things like that. So if you get a chance, if you could uh, do that questionnaire, that would be great. Okay, so I am a nephrologist here at UT Austin. So I see people with chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. My clinics are in a uh, federally qualified health center. We have two locations. So what that means is I see people who are largely either uninsured or underinsured um, and don't have access to uh, the same level of care <coughs> as other people. Um, Often their insurance doesn't always cover um, a lot of the medications that we use for chronic kidney disease. And um, I feel very passionate about the work that you do as community health workers because I often get to see these people, uh, by the time they get to my clinic as a nephrologist, it's too late and their insurance, or they don't have insurance, so I can't offer them the medications that we have to treat kidney disease. And then here in Texas, they don't really have uh, consistent options for kidney failure. So it's a real um, uh, terrible thing. And as community health workers, you all get to see these people maybe a little bit earlier in their space, in their community. So I feel very strongly about what you do. My aim with this talk is to briefly tell you what you might need to know when you're working with someone who has chronic kidney disease. So this is going to be 15 minutes of, of a lot of medical terms, but um, just a, a little bit of what you might need to know if one of uh, the individuals you're working with says, my doctor said something about the kidneys, what does that mean? So I'm going to briefly go over what Kidney, the kidneys do normally explain stages of kidney disease, um, and then talk briefly about treatment options. So these are the kidneys, the most incredible, interesting organ in the body. Um, they're kind of located in your back. Most people are born with two. Some people are born with one. Um, they're about the size of your fist, and they basically, their whole job is to make urine. Um, and then the urine drains into these tubes, and it goes into the bladder. So just in a nutshell, this is what they look like. They, in addition to cleaning blood, this is a slide I show people in clinic. So their main job is to clean blood, but they do a lot of other stuff too. They control the level of electrolytes in your body. They help you maintain healthy bones. Um, they tell your body to make more red blood cells, and they are responsible for controlling blood pressure. So basically, when your kidneys don't work as well, all of these things go awry basically. And as your kidney function gets lower, you might have problems with your electrolytes. You might have to take vitamin D and have bone issues. Your blood pressure becomes harder and harder to control and you usually become anemic. So we look at two tests when we're trying to see how the kidneys are doing. The first is a blood test. This tells us something called estimated glomerular filtration rate, eGFR. And all of this all this is is literally telling me how well the kidneys are cleaning the blood. So it's actually a measure of the amount of blood that's cleaned per minute. But people usually, I, I explain it as your percent kidney function. That's technically, you know, it's a little bit more complex than that. But people tend to understand, I think, when I use that explanation. So um, normal is around 100 or at least above 90, and it's something that we estimate. So that's important to, for people to understand. We can't directly, or to directly measure this is invasive. So we use, we measure things and then estimate the glomerular filtration rate, and that's basically just how well your kidneys are cleaning the blood. The second test is albuminuria, protein in the urine. This tells me the structural integrity of the cleaning units. So normally, the filters in the kidney 
do not allow protein or blood cells to get into the urine. So when I see protein or albumin in the urine, it basically tells me that the filters are leaking. Again, it's a little bit more complex than that, but this, so the blood test tells you how well things are cleaning the blood. The urine test tells you if the filters are actually leaking. Usually, this is super important because usually we see this happen before the kidney function, GFR goes down. So someone's blood test might look totally normal and they might hear from their doctor, oh, your kidney function is fine. If they don't have a urine test, we don't know for sure that things are okay. Um, this is a picture that uh, we have used in some of our educational materials that people also tend to understand. I show this in clinic a lot. Um, so the left side is, you know, just very simply, things are not supposed to get into the urine. Protein doesn't get in the urine. When the filters are not doing well, protein gets into the urine. So how we stage kidney disease depends on those two factors, the blood test and the urine test. The G is GFR, the A is level of albuminuria. It's important for people to know that everybody progresses differently. So it depends on a lot of factors. You might be in one stage and then stay in that stage for many, many years. You might progress very fast. It depends on a lot of things. The other thing we don't really know is how to incorporate age. So GFR naturally goes down with age, and so for older individuals, when we do these tests to estimate their GFR, it might seem like their GFR is lower, but really some of that is normal for age. We use both of these things to tell <laughs> someone how they're going to do, though, so their prognosis. And I will tell you that um, the thing that sort of determines if people progress faster is the amount of protein in their urine. So when I have someone in my clinic, I tell them, you know, this is your GFR, this is how much protein you have in your urine. The reason the protein is important is because the higher the protein in your urine, the faster your kidney function will get worse. So that is what we really, really, really try to target. and a lot of our medications uh, treat currently. Why this happens to people, the majority of uh, the, the most common cause of kidney disease in America um, is diabetes, high blood pressure. Medications can do this. Um, it ten, sometimes it runs in families. Kidney stones can cause problems. Um, sometimes if you have problems with your prostate, that can cause kidney problems, infections. There are a lot of reasons why this happens uh, to people. Yes, what I found. Oh, my Siri is trying to answer a question for me. Um, but when your kidneys function goes down, all of these things can happen. So as I said before, they're not cleaning the blood as well. You might have problems with your electrolytes. We might have issues with your bones. Your blood pressure becomes harder to control and you might become anemic. So it's important for people to understand that kidney disease is largely a silent disease. Sometimes you don't have symptoms until your kidney function is very low, um, less than 10, 15%. Symptoms you might experience at that point, itching, you might have pretty bad appetite, you might have swelling, shortness of breath, and then all of the other things I mentioned, like your blood pressure becomes harder to control, you might be anemic. Depression, anxiety, and trauma, uh, mental health problems are, are very prominent. Um, they're frequent in people who have kidney disease as well. So treatment options, and I'm gonna to try to be brief so we can get to Evelyn and Claudia, but um, when you, earlier on, stages one through five, um, we use medications to control blood pressure, diabetes, the things that are causing kidney problems. But maintaining a healthy, white, a healthy, a healthy weight um, and exercise are extremely important. Um, there's evidence to support all forms of exercise. This is frequently confusing for people who have kidney disease, but um, even uh, weight training has been shown to reduce the amounts of protein in your urine. Uh, and then we, we ask people to avoid certain medications. This is everyone's only question, you know, what can I eat when I tell them they have kidney disease? And really, I, I try to get people to add more than I get people to subtract. So 
vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. I had a guy the other day, I told him, you know, he, he, you need to eat vegetables, and I had to make sure he understood he has to eat them every day. You know, it's not just like a one-time thing. It's try to eat vegetables every day. Um, the only thing that's extremely important to, or not extremely, I have people limit sodium. That's probably the one thing if we're gonna limit something in your diet is try to avoid salt. There is some evidence that we should be avoiding red meat. That includes pork. Um, you don't necessarily have to cut it out completely, but try to make it sort of a celebratory thing. Um, but potassium and phosphorus do need to be limited, but only if their doctor tells them to do so. This is not across the board. Um, and actually, earlier on, uh, high potassium diets are good for people with high blood pressure, so it's something that someone really needs to check with their doctor. Um, they don't necessarily need to limit protein either, unless they're told to by their doctor because this can uh, cause issues with um, uh, muscle mass and mal malnourishment. Um, and same thing with fluids. They only need to limit that if they're told by their doctor. I show this uh, to all of my patients. I try to get them to eat something from this list every day. Plant, there's a lot of evidence in support of plant protein at the moment um, and how this can benefit your kidneys. So trying to get in broccoli, beans, peas, things like that. Kidney failure is when someone requires um, when basically their, their kidneys don't work and they need either dialysis or kidney transplant uh, to replace their kidneys. So there are different types of dialysis. Um, the important thing to know is uh, the optimal treatment is a kidney transplant. So people live longer uh, when they have a transplant than when they're on dialysis. Um, and so uh, we really, really want people to know all of their options and that kidney transplant is what we is the ideal treatment. There are different types of dialysis, as I said. The difference between the different types of dialysis is really patient preference. Um, they can either go to a clinic three times a week or, th or more, um, or they can do it at home. And it really, you know, the, the benefits to doing one or the other is really just depends on the person, depends on their lifestyle, depends on their support system, depends on what they're comfortable with. Um, peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis you can do while you sleep, so you can, that's, that's a big perk for a lot of people, but you often need storage space and um, you have to have uh, vision and sort of hand mobility in order to manage the machine on your own. This is a really um, something for you all to be aware of, um, and it really applies to all medical illness, but that we see a lot when someone sort of crashes into kidney failure. Um, it is tr extremely traumatic. A lot of people wake up in the hospital, they didn't know they had kidney disease, all of a sudden they're on dialysis, they're dependent, their life depends on a machine, they sort of, their mental, emotional state looks like this picture on the left. Um, we do what we can to kind of move them to the picture on the right, but as you can see, they're still broken and dealing with a lot of, um, a lot of things emotionally. So this really impacts how they uh, interact with care, their life, they're suddenly not necessarily able to work. And what we see is people go back and forth between these two, you know, sort of broken states. And so when you're working with someone who has kidney disease, um, it's just something to be aware of and being very sensitive um, to what they might be experiencing. Okay. Um, same with kidney failure, really a lot of this is, uh, at this point, that's when you need to limit foods that are high in potassium and phosphorus, um, but you do need to eat more protein when you have kidney failure. And then when you have a kidney transplant, um, you have no, no real limits unless you're told by your doctor. It's okay to have sex at any stage of kidney disease. This is a question that I know everybody wants to ask me and nobody does. So if you have, uh, if you're working with people who have kidney disease, you know, just, just be aware of this. Um, okay, so take home points. The kidney's job is to clean the blood and to make urine. 
It's important to have regular testing for kidney disease because it's a silent disease. A lot of people do not have access to testing, do not have access to treatment, and they, by the time I see them, it's too late. Um, they need to know that they need a blood test and a urine test to know how their kidneys are doing. There's no cure, but there are treatments that can keep your kidney disease from getting worse. Um, and there are several options to treat kidney failure, but people live longest when they have a kidney transplant, so that's really what we want uh, to push. Okay. So that was a lot of information. All of these slides are going to be available um, so that you can reference when you have people who have kidney disease. Um, and I'll include my contact information, too. You're always welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions.